Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Making Money on Google Play session. Uh, my name is Brahim Bushikhi. I'm product manager for commerce on Google Play. And Bob Nice over there is my colleague who is from business development on Google Play. All right, let's get started. Oh, where's the clicker? Clicker? Uh, here. All right. Sorry. OK. <laughs> um, so for, uh, first, I wanted to start by just saying thank you. Over the past 12 months, we've talked to a lot of you, got a lot of great feedback that we baked into the product. A lot of the features that you'll see next have really been developed in co uh, in, in, um, uh, by working with you and getting your feedback. So let's continue that. Let's continue that conversation. Keep sending the feedback, the good, the bad, the ugly, and we'll promise we'll keep working on it and making things better. We'll start off with the office hours, which is happening next. So come on by the Google Play office hour section, and we'll talk there. So the agenda for today, we'll first share some data. Uh, these are metrics that we feel are interesting for you as you build your business on Google Play. We'll then give you a product update. These are features we've launched recently and their impact, as well as things we look forward to in the midterm. Finally, we'll talk about some case studies about what some of our most commercially successful partners are doing. And finally, we'll close out with Q&A at the office hours uh, by the Google Play section. All right, so let's get started with some data. Um, last year, Chris Yeager got on stage, I think exactly this room, and showed us the growth trajectory of in-app. And looked something like ridiculous, well, reverse, but you know, like growing up to the right. And we were very excited about that growth. This year, we've actually done something even more incredible, which is that we multiplied in-app revenue by seven. So over the past 12 months, I mean, there are very few industries, companies, countries, anything that grows that fast over 12 months. And this is a testament to all the work you've all been doing. Users are engaged with the applications you're building, and they're willing to pay for them and are uh, really enjoying them. And so that's just incredible. So we wanted to look beyond the number and say, what is this telling us about the Google Play and Android user? And one thing we've learned is the, we've heard this a lot from our Japanese partners, which is omotenashi. And what omotenashi means in Japanese is essentially, it's, a, it's hospitality, but it's got a bit of a deeper sense. It's got more of a, a personalized experience. It's, it's almost like not a buyer and seller relationship. It's a, it's a host and a guest. And what this is, it's, it's essentially what in-app represents, right? I mean, in-app is about getting the user to enjoy the application, to really get immersed into it before getting to monetization. We've heard this a lot in all sorts of sayings where, you know, focus on the user experience and the money will follow. And that's exactly what in-app represents. Now, in-app is not for everyone, and we've got very successful subscription uh, partners as well as paid app developers. But if you're able to inject some omotenashi in your application, then please do and give it a try. And that's, what we're, that's the message from this number. Subscriptions lost about 12 months ago as well. And since launch, we're very excited that so the number of subscribers has doubled each quarter. Now, subscriptions have a pretty high hurdle, right? I mean, the user has to see continuous value they have to commit to recurring subscription that's ordering you in. And so it's got a pretty high hurdle for subscription. But yet we're seeing more and more users taking that step. And that's, again, because of the applications and the content you've all been creating for our users. There's no better example today than Pandora, which is a partner that's now on the top grossing list, one of the few non-games that's completely based on subscriptions. Now, Android is a global platform, clearly. And Google Play Store is exactly, is equally global. We have buyers in 134 markets. So by pushing that button in the Google Play Developer Council and pushing your app for sale, you're making it available to buyers in 134 countries. This is unprecedented distribution. Never before has distribution been this easy and efficient. And for you as a developer, wherever you are in the world, where you're a solo developer or a, a multinational corporation, we take care for, of everything for you, and we just have to push that button and get your application out there. Now, the countries that we've overlaid on the map are those that are, some of them are probably already in your mind. They're particularly large, growing fast, but there are also other countries that we feel are going to play a big part of the next 12 months. And so we're excited about that. And, and you know, we've launched a lot of features around localization and translations at I.O., so take advantage of that and map them up to that uh, set of countries, the 134, and, uh, and hopefully you'll see success globally. Tablets have been a big part of Android over the, pa the past 12 months. And the way the conversation generally goes is that we ask you to optimize your apps for tablets, 
And as a business owner, you look at the cost, and you say, well, that's additional cost. Uh, am I, do, is that where I invest my resources? I know you have very limited resources like everyone else. And the number I want to share with you today is that a tablet monetizes 1.7x the rate of a phone. So that additional cost of optimizing your tablet, uh, your application for tablets, is well worthwhile. And we want to see more of our developers doing just that. We've launched a lot of features on our end as well, whether it's the optimization tips for tablets or the guidelines to help you do this as well. The other metric that's interesting is recent platform releases monetize at 2.2x their prior versions. And what this is telling us is, again, as you build your application, take advantage of the latest platform features, whether it is Google Plus sign-in or, um, or uh, all of the APIs that launched at I.O. Uh, this week. All of that coming together actually has a tangible impact on your revenue. It is not just nice to have, they might be actually required for you, and you can more than double your, your revenue by actually adopting those new features. Next is, this is a very intuitive message, right? Uh, higher rated applications monetize better. But we wanted to give you a sense of just how much better. If you go from one to two, let's not talk about those, but if you go from two to three star, you're actually almost doubling your revenue. And then again, if you go from three to four stars, you're actually almost tripling your revenue. So a conversation we have around quality and reply to reviews and fixing bugs and good customer experience and good support, all of that has now a tangible impact on your revenue. And that's what we're gonna demonstrate with these metrics. Finally, as it was mentioned in the keynote, over the past year, we've more than doubled average revenue per user. This is even given the incredible growth that Android itself has been having. 900 million devices, we've actually grown ARPU by two and a half X. This is the baseline metric that every platform is measured by. How profitable are we for you? And this is really exciting for us, this particular development. And it's a testament, again, to the type of experiences you've been creating and how engaging and immersive they have been. So we'll go now into the product update portion. And I know it might be obvious or it might be uh, intuitive, but I always like to start with a baseline understanding of our mission. Everybody, we've got a bunch of people who work on payments that are sprinkled around the room. And all of us, we show up to work every day because we want to make our developers successful. And in the context of payments, we want to make sure we maximize your income. So when you work hard and build an application, an awesome application, we want to make sure you're getting the most value out of that work. That's just a baseline understanding. That's why we show up to work every day. And a lot of us, uh, that's our goal uh, and objective. So with that in mind, I again like to think of things in terms of frameworks that just simplify the conversation. In this case, I picked a really simple framework. We try to maximize your income, which means we're gonna increase your sales and reduce your costs. So our conversation going forward is gonna be around in this context. How are we maximizing your sales and how are we reducing your costs in order to maximize your income? We've also talked to you about, so what drives your sales? And you told us a bunch of things. One is the number of devices out there. How many tablets do we have? The other thing was how many markets you're targeting, right? So if we're growing really fast in a particular region, but you're actually not localizing to it or tailoring the experience to it, you're not really benefiting from that. The other aspect is the quality of your application. We just saw, if you go from three to four, you're tripling your revenue. The other aspect is how many buyers do we have? How many credit cards do we have on file? How many carrier billing accounts do we have? And then the purchase experience. How smooth is it? How well does it convert? This all impacts your sales. And finally, all of these things that happen after the fact, whether it's cancellations because of a poor user experience, the user did not get the item they purchased, and then they call, and that becomes a poor user experience. So all of these things drive your sales. Now in terms of cost, you've told us about three big buckets. These are things we've talked about in terms of tablets and optimizing for them or adopting new platform features. There's engineering work, right? You gotta, engineer, you know, you gotta have engineers, you gotta have QA, you gotta have back office and accounting. You've got your user acquisition costs. Yeah, right, so marketing, uh, paid installs, whatever it is. And then you have your support costs. So these are the three buckets that your costs largely fit into. So with that in mind, I wanna share with you some things we did to help in each of those areas. So more forms of payment. This is clearly comes up all the time. What have we done over the past 12 months to address that? First off is a Google Play gift card. It actually only launched in July of last year. And since then, it's, woo, that's right. right. 
Somebody's happy. Um, it only launched in July of last year, and since then it's become incredibly successful for us. And it's omnipresent in US retail locations. It's in the UK now. You can see us continue to invest in the Google Play gift card. The whole prepaid form of payment is critical to us. The other aspect is we launch campaigns. And what campaigns are essentially, in this case, if you bought a Galaxy S3, you got a free Galaxy S3, which is awesome, but also you got $50 to spend on Google Play. And what this does is, one, it ingests money that gets spent on your applications, and two, it lowers the hurdle for the user to go from a free app buyer, uh, consumer, to actually a purchaser. And our experiments have shown that when a user makes a one, two, three purchases, they're much more likely to make their fourth and fifth, even when the credit is over. Finally, carrier billing. And the exciting number I want to share with you today is that 50% of Google Play 30-day actives are now on carriers that support carrier billing. And what that means is that they are one button click away from becoming buyers. They don't have to type numbers, there are no expiration dates, they just have to enable it, and then they can start buying. And this is a really critical number for us. And as a background, if, you, if you're not aware of what carrier billing is, it's essentially the ability to put your purchases on your monthly bill. And this is something that's unique to Google Play, and that we've invested a lot in the technology behind it. So the other thing you said is the, bill, the purchase flow. We've heard a lot about our purchase flow in the past. I don't know if you've been through the new store as well as the new purchase flow, but that's a really exciting development for us. And a lot of the, the design came in from feedback you gave us, which was that you want the purchase flow to be contextual, right? You want it to be uh, fast, and you want it to be simple. So we did just that. And in addition to that, we made it a lot faster. So in this particular client release that came out a few weeks ago, we've seen a 35% drop in latency. In addition to that, we're seeing really good user uh, feedback, and we're seeing a pickup in conversion as well. Now, let's shift gears to costs. We've heard a lot from you around accounting and, and back office. And if you're, if you're a small developer, you might not worry too much about this. But for our large partners, it was a big problem. You couldn't get your reports uh, on a timely basis. You couldn't get them programmatically out of our database. And so we've done just that. So with the rollout of the Google Wallet Merchant Center, now, which is, if you don't have it, you should get it in a few weeks, you'll be able to use a very simple script to, to download all of your monthly reports and ingest them into your own backend and do whatever you want with them, most likely reconcile. The other aspect is support costs. And the thing about support costs is that if you look at the top level cost of lost purchases, you might feel that, well, you know, it's, it's bad, but it's not terrible. Uh, but the impact of support goes well beyond that. One is, there is the cost of the lost sale, then there's a fixed cost of supporting that call, right? So if somebody calls 10 minutes to support that user, that's a lot of money. But the worst part is, you've acquired that buyer with a certain lifetime value assumption, right? And what this does to it is it truncates their lifetime. It gets it short. And so your math, as you're looking at, is this gonna make it, uh, does this add up for me? It really gets messed up. And so support, as little as, um, you know, might not pay a lot of attention to it, it's actually critical to your revenue and sales, uh, your cost and sales. And what's the exciting metric here is IAB V3. IAB V3 launched in uh, December, and since then, Gameville has seen a 90% drop in customer contact rates for, for games where they have implemented IAB V3. So uh, there was a talk on Wednesday about it. Please go watch it on YouTube and thank that person over there for designing IAB V3. Uh, so, uh, so anyways, basically, th this is really awesome. You just need to do it. So in-app order status API. This is another big ask from you, which is essentially the ability for you to take that purchase token that we send you back and turn around and verify the status of that purchase. This is for two reasons. You could do it for either verifying authenticity of the purchase or just the state. <clears throat> And we're launching this in a few weeks worldwide. Uh, so uh, all of our developers will have access to this, and it should help a lot with reconciling your purchases and, uh, and even preventing fraud. Um, okay. The other thing is in-app billing testing. You probably heard this already, but we're now simplifying in-app billing testing by allowing your licensed test accounts, the one you already configured in the Google Play Developer Console, to actually make purchases without being charged. Everything else is the same. Just no more holds, no bins, no delays, just the same, but none of that bad stuff. 
And we think this is going to be super exciting, super helpful in streamlining your experience in testing and making sure that you're not wasting time uh, stuck in those sorts of things. When you see that message that says this is a test purchase, you know that you're not actually being charged as it says in the remainder of the sentence. All right, so to summarize, so for your sales, we've got 50% of our users now on carrier billing, we've got the Google Play gift cards, we've got promo campaigns, and we've got a faster, better purchase flow. For your costs, we've got a programmatic access to your reports, easy in-app testing, better user experience with in-app billing v3, and order status check API to prevent fraud, as well as reconcile your purchases. So this is the summary list of things that we've done already or are doing in the next few weeks to help you maximize your income. So looking forward a little bit, uh, you can see us invest more heavily in Google Play gift card. This is, you know, we're going to push it into our biggest markets, and you'll see us continue to do that. The next thing we'll do is carrier billing. It's in 12 countries today. CES pushed that further over the next few months and over the next 12 months. Uh, that's, those add up. <laughs> and then the purchase experience, right? So we've already made a huge improvement in our last release, but we're actually going to go even further. The one thing we've done so far, uh, the, the one thing we've done really critically is that we've instrumented the purchase flow so that we can analyze it and study it and continue to improve it uh, very quickly. So look for us to do a lot more experimentation, a lot more fine tuning. So when you send us a buyer, when you get a user to commit to making a purchase on your app, we want to convert as many of those as possible unless they change their mind. <laughs> and so look for us to do a lot more of that. And look for us to support more forms of payment. Uh, gift cards are just the beginning. And finally, seller support in more countries. We're all, one of, the, one of the objectives and missions of all of us is that anyone, anyone around the world can make a living on Google Play. And we want to get there. It's taken a long time. It's slower than we'd like it to be as well. But we do want to get to that point where anyone around the planet can, can, can code an awesome app and make a living out of it. And we'll get there. So why is it an exciting year ahead? I think there's a convergence of a few things for us on play. First of all, we've got global payments reach. We're really getting to the point where we've got FOPs in many, many countries, and that's, and that's going to really help with our conversion. The next thing is that we're seeing higher buyer engagement, as, as you've seen in the numbers before, across the board. Whereas in-app, subscriptions, or paid apps, users are, are willing to buy and are willing to pay for the experiences you're creating. And that's really good news for us. Finally, we're really putting the final pieces together for world-class commerce infrastructure and developer, to, and developer tools. We want to get you back to doing the things that you do well and do best, which is building awesome applications. We want to take you away from spending time trying to figure out why your account is blocked for testing purposes or why you have to download these reports in some way or the other. We want to do all of that and make sure you do what you do best, which is build awesome applications. That's all for me. I'm going to hand it over to Bob, who's going to cover a few case studies. All right. Thanks, Brahim. And hello, everyone. So to, to get the growth rates that we're seeing, we're clearly doing a lot to help support that growth. But much of the work is also being done by our developers. And so this section of the presentation will really focus on the work of those great developers. And we're focusing specifically on the most commercially successful developers. And by commercially successful, I mean the developers, they're not just building great products that their users love that are being installed in large numbers in many cases. But these are the developers that are making money on Google Play. And I'll focus on two, two key parts in this uh, section. So one will just be to help you understand more about what these developers are doing. And then I'd also really like to focus on how you can apply some of these lessons to your own businesses. So as Brahim said, we've seen a 7x increase in the last year in in-app revenue. Signs of in-app revenue growth are all over the Play Store. If you look at the top grossing apps right now, all of the top grossing apps are free to play. But with every rule, there's always an exception. And so we have a fun game we like to play called Where's Minecraft? And so there it is down there at number 22. And so what we're, we are not saying you need to push everything free to play. Uh, Minecraft is an amazing game. Uh, it's, it's an iconic brand with a very loyal following. We think it'll continue to be successful. Uh, so we, we are not asking you to follow the crowd to do that. However, also recognize the dominant trend towards free to play. Uh, it's very important to recognize that. The bar for success for a paid title in the top grossing charts is very high. 
more than anything, this, the trend that we see is developers allowing users to defer that payment decision. We see a three-step funnel to monetization. So the first step is really around acquisition. And so this is about expanding this top of the funnel as wide as you possibly can, getting as many users as you can to press that install button. The install counts on Google Play are public within a, a certain band. And just go check out some of your favorite paid apps and free apps and check out the large, large difference in the, the, the large number of free installs that happen on Google Play. Second, retention. And we think this is really an underappreciated part of the funnel. It's part of the omatanashi that Brahim was mentioning earlier. It's an area where our smartest developers are spending more and more of their time. And the thing that you need to focus on here is really on earning the ability to ask those users for money. It's not something you can take for granted. For example, if I asked all of you to rate my talk a couple minutes into it right now, you might ask for a little bit more time to see, like, hey, what's this guy actually going to talk about, right? Uh, and the same sort of principle applies here. So have your users get into your product, provide value to them, have them coming back over time, and clearly there, we've seen signs that users are more likely to pay after they've had an experience. And then finally, obviously, pressing that buy button and monetization. And what we've found is it's very important, uh, and there's a lot of differences in terms of when and how developers ask users to pay. And now I'll, I'll do a first case study that introduces these uh, three principles. So Kiwi is an Android-focused developer led by Omar Siddiqui. Omar's actually going to be joining us for the office hour session afterwards. Uh, and Shipwrecked has been their most successful game on Google Play. It'll also be the subject of the case study in the following slides. Kiwi has three other games on Google Play, including Monsterama Park, Brightwood Adventures, and Monsterama Planet, which was recently released. When we spoke with them, they said, for acquisition, really invest in your Play Store page. It sounds basic, but the little things matter. You see here in the description, millions of players agree that Shipwrecked Lost Island, an editor's choice app, is one of the top free games on Android. In just a few words, they, they communicate a lot of powerful principles. It's one of the first experiences that a user has with your application, and these words really create a powerful impression. Also on the right, you see videos. We found that videos is a very powerful way to communicate the, the value of your product, and it helps differentiate you against all of the other products that do not have videos in their titles. Second, retention, as we said, is very important. Here, when you think of retention, thinking about rewarding those user actions that you want your users to take. So in here on the left, as you see that, it's very important to have daily retention, and you see a reward, a daily login bonus, that rewards those players for taking the actions that you want them to take. On the right, you see a leveling up. You see the time and the effort that your users are spending in that application being rewarded through new content and new features being unlocked and other rewards happening. Further on retention, keeping the content fresh and unlocking big new content, in this case, a full new island, Atlantis in this case, allows your users to stay engaged with the game or the application and explore all of this new content. Also, you can even think about reinventing the user experience. When Shipwreck first launched, it was really focused around exploration and collection. After launch, they added a, a trading mechanic, which users actually loved. It was a bit of a risk, but users love this, and they keep coming back to the game over and over. On the topic of monetization, we've found that merchandising really matters. I think this monkey's great here. He's pointing out this awesome deal, if you can't see the, uh, the little text there. But 24 gold for $2.99, who can beat that? You see below it, you can go to the full store, but why not pull out one of the most attractive offers and put it right there and make it easy for users to buy? And so, as you saw with Kiwi, acquisition is about improving your Play Store page, Retention is about rewarding the user behaviors that you want to promote and about reinventing the user experience. In monetization, merchandising matters. But it's not just enough to go linearly through this. What we're seeing the most successful developers on Google Play do is they create a virtuous cycle by feeding back to acquisition several different ways. So those developers that are able to find success and make money on Google Play can reinvest those earnings through paid user acquisition to fuel for future growth of their products. Similarly, those developers that have a great number of retained users can cross-promote those users, especially the developers that have multiple titles, back into acquisition. 
And then finally, those developers that are fortunate enough to reach the top list, that becomes a self-fueling cycle. You need a lot of installs to get there, but you get a lot of installs from being there. And now I'll talk about some of these concepts with the other case studies. The second one we'll introduce today is DNA. And the game that we'll mostly focus on is the successful game Blood Brothers. They have another, a couple of other hit titles, including Marvel, War of Heroes, and Rage of Bahamut, which was a clear breakout hit through 2012. DNA also has six other games in the top 100 top grossing. So because they have so many successful titles, they really focus on cross-promotion. In this case, I was playing Blood Brothers on the left. While I was playing, I received this promotion. Play Marvel and receive 50 MOBA coin. It's a way for them to target a, a very attractive user base, the users who are playing their existing games, and use them to acquire them for the new games that are launching. It's also important for retention to provide very clear objectives. The central objective in the game Blood Brothers is a card collection mechanic. It's all around strengthening your characters, which they call familiars. All of the core game loops in the game support this core objective. It's a, it's a very powerful thing. They focus you on a single core objective, and then you have a, a game loop of adventuring, battling, leveling up your characters, all fueling back into that one objective of strengthening your characters. Even as you add more complexity to the game, when you battle and you win, you capture a character. There's a variety of ways that you can combine these characters all back towards that central objective of strengthening your characters. And one thing that's particularly worth calling out is DNA success with events. So events are variations on the standard gameplay that happen for a very limited amount of time, a fixed duration, that provide important rewards. And in this case, they provide rare characters which are extremely valuable within the context of the game. Again, feeding back to uh, strengthening your characters. But the importance here is creating that sense of urgency through having a limited time window in providing something is very valuable. And that combination is very powerful. You can say, how powerful is it? The monetization in that game actually doubles on an average revenue per user basis during these events. So there's a clear payoff to finding the ways to, to make your game work for users, to create that sense of urgency, to give the players that great experience, to provide a slightly different game experience, to give them a different way to interact with other users. And clearly, there's a financial reward for doing this within the game. Next, we're going to talk about Kabam, another very successful developer that has moved just last year from the web over to mobile. So in Kabam's case, we're going to focus their case study on Kings of the Camelot, Battle for the North. They also have several other successful titles on Google Play, including The Hobbit, Arcane Empires, and the soon-to-release Fast and Furious 6. One of the lessons from Kabam was always be testing. Kabam focuses on core gaming users. Core gaming users monetize much better than your average user. And was, as a result of being able to earn that revenue, they're able to reinvest those earnings back into paid user acquisition. In this case here, they're doing a split test on several different campaigns. On the campaign on the left, you can see a campaign focused around characters and concept. On the campaign on the right, you can see a campaign much more focused around a realistic depiction of gameplay. Kabam is always testing, and so based on the relative success of each of these campaigns, they can add more resources to one, take them away from another, and be very flexible in growing their overall user base. In terms of retention, as I mentioned, Kabam recently came from web over to mobile, and they quickly realized a difference in those users. The mobile sessions were much more frequent. There were many more sessions through the course of the day, but they were also shorter. And so one of the first things that they did was change the way that they did the content refreshes to make them more frequent. You can also see, visually depicted here, on the left, that's the web game. And there's a very rich landscape of gameplay elements. Many of the major elements are spread further apart. It's really de designed to be played with a, a mouse and keyboard, obviously. And on the right, you have a much more streamlined game experience on mobile. Uh, you know, many of the user actions are able to be taken right from your thumb in a very easy way. Now, on monetization, Kabam really focuses on providing visual consistency. As I said, it's really important how you ask your users for payment. And in their case, they want to minimize any confusion. And so here, through all three screens, you can see the exact identical presentation throughout. The final case study today will be on Pandora. Pandora is a company that's extremely well known. It hardly needs an introduction. 
the, the leading internet radio service. Kabam is one of those lucky few apps that has reached the top of the lists. And so from there, it's, you know, they're, uh, it, it, it's hard to get there, but when you do, it's quite powerful. But what I really want to focus on with Pandora, that's a recent change that they've made, is around monetization. And so as Brahim had alluded to earlier, uh, as you can see in the chart here, something changed in February. And what was that change? So the thing that changed in February is Pandora implemented our in-app billing subscriptions. Previously, before that time, while the revenue was in payments were much flatter, you had to go actually from your mobile device over to Pandora on the web and sign up for a subscription there to be able to use the subscriptions on mobile. By reducing all of that payment friction, by allowing a user to purchase directly from the mobile device, they saw a big bump in, in overall payments. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even better the next month. Because what happened here? So at this time, Pandora still allowed users 40 free hours of mobile listening per month. But for those users who reached those 40 free hours and still wanted more, Pandora asked them to pay. And that's what really allows this. And Omotenashi is, is the theme. It's finding that mix of, you have users, you're providing a great value to users. For free, you're providing 40 free hours of mobile listening per month. But yet, there's so many users who want to help you build their biz your business. They love the product so much that they, uh, they're, they're happy to pay at that time. So in summary, when you're thinking about acquisition, think about improving your Play Store page and investing in your Play Store page. Consider cross-promotion, especially with multiple different applications. For those applications that are making money, reinvest those earnings for paid user acquisition. And of course, everybody wants to get at the top of the charts. For retention, really think about rewarding the user actions that you're trying to promote and consider reinventing your user experience. It's really important to provide clear objectives to users and to support those objectives with the overall user experience. Design for mobile, it's important and users will notice. And on to monetization, the way that you merchandise within your products on mobile matters. If you change new gameplay mechanics, users will notice, and you can drive huge success. Present a consistent visual experience. And finally, there's, still, there's developers that have charts like this, and we're looking forward to even more of these in the coming year. And so that concludes the prepared part for our talk. As we mentioned, following this talk, we'll be taking Q&A in the office hour areas. We'd also like to point out a few other. We have time, maybe we'll do questions. Yeah, we can, we can, do, we can do a few now. But uh, you know, we'd like to specifically point out a few that we thought were particularly noteworthy and valuable for your time. And then most importantly, we'd like to say thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for your time today. We'd like to thank some of the, the, the developers that were part of this. I see Kabam here in the front row. Thank you guys very much. And then thank you to all of the developers on Google Play. Uh, it's been an amazing past year, but the future, I believe, is even brighter. I had one quick question. Uh, can I ask now? Uh, you, you, you said something about the carrier billing, apart from the gift card. What is that carrier billing? Um, so carrier billing is basically the ability for a user to put their purchases on their monthly bill. So the same bill you get from your, uh, from your provider, uh -huh. you just put all your purchases on that bill. And so it just adds up to that. Oh, so if you want to do international calling or something, is it used for that or for what? Uh, it's used for buying in-app products. So when you're, let's say, playing a game or you're even subscribing to Pandora, uh -huh. you can put your Pandora subscription or your monthly phone bill. Oh, that way. Okay. Yeah. Hello. I'm having a little bit of time just judging business models and evaluating business models when I'm thinking about developing apps. Like, for example, you're talking about 7x improvements, 5x improvements, 2x improvements, and all that sounds great, but 0 times 5 is still 0. So yeah. the question is, what does it mean to be in the 100 top grossing apps? Is there any charts of, like, revenue actual dollars per month if you are a certain percentile of your app in that top grossing list? I'm having a really hard time finding useful data in that direction. Um, so I would say that's probably like partner data. Like, you know, we, we generally can't share uh, information like that about how much revenue are people making at different rankings. It's, it varies a lot. 
uh, depending what type of application is up there. Clearly, if, you're, if you have a $9.99 a month subscription and you're on the top grossing, that gets you up there faster, and it just it varies a lot, so it's kind of hard for us to give a firm number there. Sure. Even if it's like completely anonymized statistics, like if your app is in the top 2%, you can expect, I don't know, $3,000 a month? Uh, you want more just what is the data behind it? I mean, we, we can yeah, just very rough uh, guidelines. Can I expect to make 30 bucks a month, 3,000 bucks a month, 300,000 bucks a month if I have a top 2% app? I don't it's just really hard to get a feeling for this. Sure. I mean, if you're interested enough, like there, there's data that's out there. A number of the developers are publicly traded. And mm -hmm. so there you can get a sense of what their revenues are. It, it, as Brahim said, it's challenging for us to share our partners' data. We, ha we all have okay. confidentiality agreements. We've tried as much as possible through this presentation to be as open. And over time, we become more and more open. But if you want to talk more, we can find you at office hours. OK, thanks. Hey, um, uh, now with version three of the in-app billing, how soon can we uh, expect to be able to do uh, multiple purchases of a single item, for instance? Purchase 200 tokens, you know, for two bucks, and have Google Play handle um, uh, the maintenance of that. Uh, so that's versus configuring one SKU that equals 200 uh, yeah. tokens. Um, it's not in the immediate roadmap, but it's something we've talked about in the past. Uh, so I'll take that back to to the team and and, and see if we can prioritize it. Uh, and the use case, is it just a maintenance issue or? Well, I mean, I can, I can do it right now, but I'll have to build my own server infrastructure to manage the consumption of those 200 tokens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I'd really like to do is I'll allow the user to purchase 200 tokens, and then as they use them in game, I just tell Google Play, you know, consume one token, mm -hmm. consume one token. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, do you have any tip or what's better? Do you an, an light in the pro app or do a light app with an app purchase? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get You're that. saying whether you should do two different applications yeah. or whether you do a free app with an app purchase? Yeah. Oh. What, one, one, uh, one area we found is whenever developers have two different apps, it creates a lot of overhead. So, so some of the general guidance is simplifying, finding one application to invest all of your resources behind. Otherwise, it can lead to confusion. So the general best practice is to invest in a single app, especially for smaller developers. And the upgrade experience is not as nice, right? Because you have to get them to go install a different app and buy another app versus just in-app purchase. Mm -hmm. And you upgrade, you unlock the new content immediately in the app. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I was wondering if you uh, are considering doing promo codes for paid apps, and are you also considering uh, affiliate programs? Um, yeah, those are things that we've looked into as well. Uh, we've launched the uh, promotional campaigns in terms of promo codes for money, so you can actually get you know fifty dollars, as I mentioned in the in the earlier Galaxy S3 uh, uh, campaign. But we're looking as well into being able to allow developers to uh, issue promo codes and have them redeemed by whether it's the press or reviewers or whomever it is. Yes. And what about the uh, affiliate programs? Do you, do you, um, are you going to launch that soon? Uh, I don't think it will launch soon, but we're definitely talk about them, especially in the content side uh, of uh, Google Play. But uh, we'll definitely take that back to the team. All right, thanks. How are you defining what is a, a top app? Is it the you know the, the top sales that day, that week, that month? And are you also doing any editorializing around that, where you're just putting in things that you like? No, no, no. The, all of the top lists are, are straight up algorithmic. In there, that's it's revenue uh, transacted through Google Play, uh, and it's generally over a week time frame. One week time frame. Yep. And same thing across free free paid apps or free free there, apps paid apps, etc. There was there was a talk earlier about discovery that Ankit Jain gave. It's one of those we've highlighted, and that was actually all about that, uh, all yep. about discovery and, and and top lists and those sorts of things. Okay. Um. You had an example about the kind of creative that works well in the Play Store and uh, what your listing should contain. Do you have similar recipes or insights about how to do paid user acquisition, which you also briefly mentioned? What works in paid user acquisition? We, we observe it. We, we don't make recommendations. There's a part of Google's business which is fully separate from us with you know, the ads business, which focuses more on that. For us, it, the, the conversation today was more around observing it more so than, than recommending. But there's there's plenty of other smart people, either other developers that are out there that are doing it, uh, or the, the the vendors themselves that I'm sure would be happy to educate you. If I have a paid application with low download numbers, one way I could boost those 
is to offer it free for a period of time, say a week or a month or even a day. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still not possible and why? Converting a, a free app to a paid app. Other way. Or the, uh, I have a paid app now. I want to make it free for a day or for a week. And then bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have to take that back to the developer console team. That's more of a, you know, kind of how do we manage the SKUs and what types of SKUs are out there, like each product and categorization. Um, but we'll, I'll take that back to the team. Sure. And I think that's it. And our, our time is up. So we really appreciate your questions. Please follow up with we us. We have right office now. hours. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Cool.